Good afternoon and um, thank you for the invitation to uh, address you today and uh, I welcome the opportunity. It seems I've been spending more than 10 years of my life following Jeff onto the podium for uh, a whole lot of these presentations but, um, but it's great to see the, the bottom line in all of this now is the rapid deployment of IPv6 as ultimately a saviour to the internet as we want it to become. Um, not necessarily as we've known it and gone before. So I'd like to talk to you about the Asia-Pacific IPv6 Task Force, and uh, I'm um, the acting chair of uh, this organisation, and uh, our um, existing chair, Tony Hill, is taking a leave at the moment um, to recover from an illness, and uh, he um, sends his regards and would like to have been here himself. However, we will go forward, and, uh, and we'll see how we go. Asia-Pacific IPv6 Task Force was established nearly 10 years ago to bring together the initiatives of a number of different countries that were and economies that were deploying IPv6 and to help the IPv6 forum, the industry forum, actually provide some leadership in a number of different areas. And we hold meetings twice a year, usually in conjunction with APNIC and the APRICOT meetings that take place and we attempt to uh, offer a portal to uh, different economies to actually have them integrate their IPv6 activities and to help support the services that, uh, that are running. So these meetings are held uh, physically twice a year and we also encourage remote participation so people can actually dial in uh, to, if I can use the, uh, the telephone term for using Skype or whatever particular um, SIP services you use to actually uh, participate in these activities and to take it forward. So it's an umbrella, the Asia Pacific IPv6 Task Force is an umbrella group to help different economies in the Asia Pacific region coordinate their activities. We, uh, based on the 56 economies that are identified by APNIC um, and these are the services that include Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan and uh, China and uh, Australia and a number of different organisations, uh, companies around. Uh, not all of these countries actually have IPv6 forums or IPv6 groups, but many of them do, and uh, that's growing all the time. So we have a fairly uh, dramatic uh, increase in the number of people participating in these activities. One of the things we do do is an economic update. So we invite the economies who come to these meetings to participate in IPv6 based services and it's becoming a very interesting way to track what's actually happening with IPv6 deployment. We're going to see a lot of statistics. We have already seen quite a few statistics that come from different sources, but they only ever track part of the picture. One of the themes that I would like to develop today is this idea that there's a lot more V6 happening than the statistics would suggest. And there is a lot of uh, enterprise deployment of IPv6 and a number of, and I will talk about some of these activities that are going on. So the public face of IPv6 that we see in these statistics don't tell the whole story. Um, and it's only part of the V6 environment that, uh, that we're actually going to address. Jeff talked about the regulators, he talked about the end users, he talked about the ISPs, he talked about the uh, service providers and the consumer um, CPE suppliers, the DSL modems and the other suppliers and that focus is primarily on the internet and the public internet. Um, it doesn't address a lot of the issues around what's happening with enterprises in the local area networks and the TCP IP exchanges that are taking place within the networks themselves. How you talk to your printers, how you talk to your content services, how you talk to other computers that are actually on your network, how motor vehicles actually communicate with each other in private networks that are independent of the public internet. All of this is part of the big IPv6 picture that we shouldn't lose um, sight of and we should uh, encourage uh, different sorts of organisations to measure and to, uh, to give us that information. Part of doing that is with these economic updates. Now we've seen APNIC um, do a very good job at actually tracking the um, services that are actually provided on behalf of their membership for which is primarily the ISPs of this world and it doesn't track a lot of the data that's actually beginning to grow in these areas. Having said that, it's still from an extremely small base. 
Um, but it is growing and it is something that a theme that I would like to actually develop uh, along these lines. The, we have a long way to go from the development of these protocols, but, uh, but we are also starting this move in a fairly dramatic fashion. So although we're coming off a very low base, this point's been made several times and I'll go past it fairly quickly, but uh, the real thing that's, that's driving public interest in IPv6 at this stage is the exhaustion of the IPv4 technical pool. And so these uh, regional internet registries are seen here receiving their last IPv6, this is in February last year, and this is the uh, heads of the APNIC and uh, Aaron and um, the uh, Latin American service, the AFRINIC and, uh, and RIPE NCC, the European registry, receiving their last IPv4 services um, in the United States last year. So back on February 2011. This was the part that really picked up the services that, uh, that were really going. We've seen um, uh, Google, as uh, Jeff pointed out, but also Akamai, um, as uh, uh, Mr. Lee pointed out, um, as one of the largest service suppliers. But again, on the public internet, these are content services that are essentially moving. And we're seeing the beginning of the slow growth um, of these take-ups that are actually taking place. So Akamai has a number of different statistics that actually you know, track the numbers of users that are actually hitting their servers around the world. And it's just one of a number of different statistical pools that are available to us to keep track of what's actually happening. And they're seeing around about 370 to 400 hits a second on their servers coming in via V6 at this stage. And it's a fairly important part. They then further break down their statistics, and all of these are available publicly on the web. Um, and they break down their statistics into Asia Pacific and then in country statistics that actually break them down further. So um, this uh, demonstrates, the top graph demonstrates Asia Pacific Akamai services. So these are services that are actually going to the Akamai server um, and the hits that are actually coming down. The bottom one actually demonstrates Australia, the country where I come from and I, I'm president of the IPv6 forum in Australia, uh, as well as the acting head of the, uh, the Asia Pacific task force. Uh, for the time being. And you can see that uh, Australian implementation is very poor um, compared to a number of different services that are running there. But again, it's growing, and this just recommends uh, the servers that are Akamai based um, in that network. It's just one example of the number of services that are actually there. There are examples of some pretty significant increases in IPv6 usage. Jeff mentioned uh, Comcast in the United States, probably one of the largest deployers of IPv6 in the US now, along with T-Mobile. And the mobile operators themselves uh, have a stark choice to make about whether they continue to use NAT, which many of them are, the network address translation reuse of IPv4 protocols, or whether they go to IPv6. And around the world, there's been a number of examples, um, NTT Docomo um, in uh, the services where T-Mobile, Free, and others, the people around the world where their mobile networks are beginning to deploy. IPv6. However, there are also a large number of mo mobile deployments where there is no IPv6 and it represents an enormous black hole for the development and sad to say that um, uh, my country is just as bad in doing that as, uh, as anybody else at the moment. So we've seen a number of different um, examples. I'll bring it a little closer to home. Um, one of the initiatives that I think were fairly important for the deployment of IPv6 in uh, Australia was the decision a few years ago by the Australian Federal Government to adopt IPv6 um, and to make that protocol available by the end of this year, by the end of 2012, and they will have substantially achieved most of that. It doesn't mean they're necessarily using IPv6 within their network, but all their networks are IPv6 capable. And so increasingly they're going to get to an interesting position where they're supporting both IPv4 and IPv6 and the pain of maintaining two protocols, two billing services, two accounting services, two network management services, two troubleshooting services, two diagnostic services, two help desk support services, all of that pain will, will continue to increase until we get to an inflection point where people will abandon the IPv4 protocol and bring everything over to IPv6 if they can, because the pain of maintaining two protocols will grow and become quite an issue for them. In China, we've seen some substantial um, developments, and I, I won't talk too much about that because uh, we're, we have a speaker who's going to talk about that in a bit more detail. But the Chinese deployments of IPv6 in their network, uh, as Jeff is very aware, the Australian Academic Research Network um, in Australia has been a, 
a heavy IPv6 adopter in its um, RNET3 program and it has, was the first major adopter of IPv6 in the country and are running services. Now that we've um, kind of jointly won the square kilometre array, um, there will be an international network of high-speed um, fibre connecting a very large international astro astronomical telescope that will actually be based using IPv6 protocols to communicate between different services. So South Africa um, and a whole lot of uh, different um, countries, New Zealand, Australia, will actually be participating in a large astronomical research facility that will run IPv6 in these services and these things help people actually move. We've seen Singapore, Taiwan, um, and Japan deploy IPv6 in important ways. We, in Australia, for example, we are deploying the National Broadband Network, a fibre to the home network that will cover 93% of the population. It is anticipated that many of those users on that network will become IPv6 users as a way of controlling the multiple services that are actually going to be presented to them. And so V6 deployment in our National Broadband Network will become quite a significant demand um, uh, source for IPv6 services and training and equipment and facilities and knowledge and um, design and, and other sorts of support activities that will go on. But I think NTT's um, IPv6 service over their, their LTE network is a fine example of where you know, companies have bit the bullet and are deploying V6 services um, for mobility and for services that are, uh, that are actually there. Now, all of these economic updates that I've talked about are all available on, the, on the, our website. So you can go down and have a look at the individual country presentations and the services that are actually there from the economies. So I invite you to go to our website and there's information here and I can certainly make it available to you. But all of this is publicly available and you can go and have a look at the services that are running. Again, uh, Jeff actually presented the same slide. We'll probably see the same sorts of slides presented quite often. Um, but um, Google traffic stats are showing this very dramatic growth from an extremely low base. And what we see is that country deployments are beginning to grow in these areas. And so Google tracks IPv6 hits on the Google infrastructure by country. So you can actually have a look at the individual country services. Now Jeff's gone through some of those graphs in his own material. And although this is coming off a very low base, it is, however, quite um, an important uh, increase in the services. But again, this is only Google, and Akamai is only Akamai, and doesn't actually talk about the services that are actually running internally within the network. I know of four or five major government departments, for example, in Australia who have converted their networks to IPv6 and are using it internally, and these statistics never show up anywhere in the public internet. These networks are not connected to the public internet. They actually run as private networks nationally around the country. It's a point I wanted to leave you with. We also have um, uh, an ability to use the Asia-Pacific IPv6 Task Force to exchange information, and the US government have been very forthright in putting a lot of information out on the net. And Peter Tesronius um, has just published um, IPv6 adoption guides, and these are available to you um, to, uh, to actually help you with a whole lot of services um, that are actually running in that network. We've got the World IPv6 launch um, that's actually coming up now and I, my congratulations to the Internet Society in Hong Kong for the leadership role that they're actually taking um, and I think it's uh, wonderful that, uh, that we can be here today at Cyberport to actually make that happen. The next Asia Pacific IPv6 task force meeting is actually in um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia coming up in August, the end of August and I invite you, as many of you to come or to log in remotely if you can to those facilities and participate in our activities there and there's uh, more information on our website. Um, I have an unabashed plug for the 8th Australian, um, we've been doing this for eight years now, but the 8th Australian IPv6 summit uh, which will be in October and um, Jeff, as you know, is one of our um, speakers who comes to that quite regularly so um, and tells us um, enhanced versions of the same story for many years and it's been wonderful to see some degree of consistency there. So uh, I'm pleased about that. But uh, you're more than welcome to participate and again we will be looking at remote participation for people who can't physically travel. I'll finish up at this stage. The Asia Pacific IPv6 task force mailing lists are open to all so uh, if you um, go to these sites you can address that and there's more information um, at our website Asia Pacific uh, hyphen ipv6taskforce.org. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you.